Casey Buckles is the Brian and Janelle Brady as Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Notre Dame and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. She also serves as an affiliated faculty member for the Lab for Economic Opportunity, which we heard about yesterday, uh, and the Notre Dame Center for Families and Children. She earned her MA in Political Economics and her PhD in Economics from Boston University, studying under Claudia. Um, Casey's research focuses on the economics of the family, uh, and she's published several papers on women's decision-making regarding fertility. Casey has looked at a whole host of outcomes and how they relate to kids, including research examining uh, adoption, breastfeeding, birth spacing, and marriage, just to name a few, and how those uh, behaviors and outcomes all influence children. Thank you for having me. Uh, and this also gave me a really nice opportunity to work with my uh, former advisor, Claudia Olivetti. So uh, this has been really fun. And Claudia did a very nice job here of showing us what's happened with marriage and divorce, both over time and across groups within the United States. Um, and so now I'm going to turn the discussion to thinking about marriage and the economy. Right, and so what you can see here is that uh, I'm going to start by talking about inequality, which I think we can all agree has emerged as kind of one of the keywords of this conference. It's something that keeps coming up again and again. So if I could pick out three of the facts that Claudia showed us, uh, she showed us that well-educated uh, women especially are more likely to marry and they have more stable marriages that are less likely to end in divorce. Well-educated people are also uh, tend to marry one another and well-educated women are more likely to work and live in two-income households. So if you put those three things together, those are ingredients for rising household-level income inequality. So that's what we can see. Um, well, and, and this is an idea that's gotten a lot of traction um, in recent years as the topic of inequality itself has um, uh, become very popular during the Great Recession um, and in recent years. So here are some popular press quotes, uh, press titles. So The Atlantic, How America's Marriage Crisis Makes Income Inequality So Much Worse. Forbes, The Biggest Reason for Income Inequality is Single Parenthood. And then Freakonomics, since we're here at Chicago, How the New Model of Marriage May Drive Income Inequality. But there, they're citing a paper by Jeremy Greenwood and some co-authors that looks at the relationship between assorted of meaning and, and uh, income inequality. So here's the picture though. We've seen a few pictures over the last couple of days of what's going on with uh, rising inequality. This I think is the first time we've really seen it broken out by family status this way. So if I look at what's happening in this picture, uh, starting in 1950 to 1970, all four of these groups are seeing uh, rises in household, uh, median household income. But since about 1970, uh, for married women, uh, married households where the wife stays at home or single dad, single mom households, income growth has been pretty much flat. The only group that's seen a rise in income since 1970 are married households where the wife works outside of the home. So I want to turn away from inequality for a little bit, uh, though, and think about, or it's not really turning away, it's um, breaking out the discussion to think about what it is that's going on uh, with low education groups and people at the bottom of the income distribution um, in the, move, the shift away from marriage. So I'm going to start by going with a couple of potential explanations here that I'll uh, go ahead and tell you are not going to work, but let's think about why they don't work. So the first is that the women's, uh, women's movement, the increasing educational attainment, or especially the rising labor force participation of women uh, is working to destabilize marriages. Um, and so Pope Francis very obligingly commented on this just on Wednesday. Um, and I have to say that it was very useful to have an Italian collaborator in this project because uh, this speech that he gave on Wednesday got quite a bit of attention here in the US uh, press, but he mostly that attention focused on what he had to say about gender gap, uh, the gender gap in income inequality. Um, but he actually had a lot of really interesting things to say, and in typical Pope Francis fashion, he said them in a very animated way about marriage, which was really what the address was about. So what he says here is that many believe that the change that has occurred in recent decades was set in motion by the emancipation of women. This is not valid. Moreover, it is an insult. It is not true. It is a form of sexism, which always wants to dominate the woman. We behave as badly as Adam. When God told him, why did you eat the fruit? He answered, she gave it to me. It is the fault of the woman, poor woman. We must defend the woman, eh? Well, I'm going to help him by defending the woman a little bit here with some empirical data to say that he was exactly right about this. Um, so 
but uh, the genesis of this idea is that you know where we really saw the decline in marriage that Claudia was talking about, um, although I think you know, one of the things I take away from what she was showing is that if, if you mark the decline from 1950 to 1960 forward, that really was an amazing historical period of uh, family formation. Right? But so when people talk about the decline and index it by that point, that's kind of an unusual point to pick in some ways. But nonetheless, if you think about families declining uh, over recent decades, a lot of that decline took place over the 70s and 80s. That's exactly the period where we saw the rapid growth in women's labor force participation um, and career attainment. So in that sense, it kind of matches. But if you take the longer view as Claudia showed us, it doesn't match so much. And in fact, we've continued to see a decline in marriages among low education or low income groups since the 1980s, despite the fact that labor force participation women, uh, women has continued to grow, although at a slower pace. So the time series data isn't great. The cross-section data is worse. Um, so Claudia was showing us that the groups that have the highest labor force participation are the high education women, uh, and those are the women that also have the lowest divorce rates. So just looking across women, this doesn't seem to hold a lot of water. And then here's a picture that uses uh, variation across states within the US. So on the horizontal axis here, we have the labor force participation rate of married women. And on the horizontal or the vertical <coughs> axis, we have the divorce rate in that state. And there's a clear negative relationship here. Now, this is just a correlation, but in, this is some work that Claudia is working, uh, is doing right now. You know, if you do this in a regression framework and you control for a lot of things, the characteristics of the states and things, this relationship holds. Um, so between uh, what we can see in the time series and the cross section, um, we have ruled out this explanation as a major contributor to the decline of marriage in low education groups. So another one um, that's going to include, a, could include a whole lot of things is policy changes, right? So we could, there's probably a list, you know, 20, 30 long that we could think about policies that might affect marriages. Um, so I'm going to focus though on ones that have explicitly tried to make divorce easier or marriage harder. And in Claudia's data, we did see that um, in the 1970s, which was the period when access to unilateral divorce or no-fault divorce was expanding, we did see an increase um, in divorce rates. Right? But as she alluded to, we get very little effect in the long run. So there is some dispute among economists, uh, of course there is, but mm -hmm. some, some dispute on um, you know, how big the long, whether there's a long-run effect or not. But even when people find something of an effect, it's quite small. Right, so it doesn't seem to be uh, a big term, a big contributor. And then moreover, if you think about what's going on among low socioeconomic status groups, for example, with unwed childbearing, we don't have more kids in single parent homes because there's an increase in divorce. That's a part of it. But the biggest explanation for that is that the parents were never married in the first place. Right, so it's, um, the story there is, seems to be more about too little marriage, as I say here, not about too much divorce. All right, we can also talk about is marriage becoming more costly? Is it harder to get married um, now? Or are there uh, consequences to that decision, economic consequences? So this is something I thought about myself and some of my own work. And so as Bill was describing yesterday, Bill Evans, um, in his panel discussion, you know, one of the ways that economists try to answer these questions, which are very hard, where it's very hard to disentangle um, correlation from causation, is to try to look for ways in which the world creates the experiment that we would want to do. So with my co-authors, Melanie Gouldy and Joe Price, we were trying to find some way that there's been a change in the cost of marriage to see, um, in this case, we were going to try and look at um, the effect of marriage on some other outcome. But what we found is the uh, source of change, the, the change in the cost of marriage that we wanted to use was the repeal of blood test requirements in the United States. So as some of you may know, um, as recently as 1980, there were 34 states in the country where you had to get a blood test in order to get a marriage license. And these were typically for syphilis or rubella. Um, syphilis is now a treatable disease and we have a vaccine for rubella. So this was no longer a public health concern and states started to repeal these requirements. So that now only one state, Mississippi, still requires you to get a blood test in order to get a marriage license. So what we see here in our, uh, in our data, this dotted line shows those 16 states that never had a blood test requirement. The darker line shows what happened in the states that did have a blood test requirement in the year that it got repealed. And so what you see here is that um, they were, the, the marriage rate was lower in the uh, blood test states beforehand, but they were on a similar trend. And then as soon as those states repealed their uh, blood test laws, marriage rates jumped up in those states and were pretty close to what they were in the other states before. 
Okay, so that actually suggests that people respond to changes in the cost of getting married. Um, and here they respond to something that actually seems like a pretty small cost relative to what we might think the benefits of marriage are. So this suggested to us that there actually are people who are on the margin for these decisions, first of all. We saw this most acutely for low education groups where you think the cost might be most binding. But we also found that um, it, it seems like about two thirds of this effect is driven by the fact that the requirement for a blood test imposes a waiting period. So it really seems like um, ma by making you go to the doctor and wait for the results and then take them in to get your license, that makes you wait three, five days, maybe two weeks to have to get a marriage license. And that deterred a lot of spur of the moment marriages. So in that way, maybe that's a good thing if um, making you wait two or three days makes you not get married. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this shows that there's some responsiveness to changes in policy. Okay, so now we return to the question though of whether a decline, the decline in marriage that we've seen for these groups over recent decades could be attributable to policy. Well, the example I've just shown you here is one where it's actually gotten easier to get married, not harder, all right? And in fact, that's generally been the trend with a lot of marriage-related policies. So welfare policy is another good example. Uh, welfare reform in the 1990s, one of its real goals was to try to remove disincentives for uh, marriage um, from welfare policy. Um, so I, I think a way to summarize that uh, the policy changes is to say that generally the move has been to try to remove barriers to marriage and to lower uh, the cost of getting married. Uh, I had a Nebraska legislator contact me after this paper saying that he wanted to enact a policy to waive marriage license fees, um, since that seems to be a barrier uh, to marriage. Okay, so what I'm going to offer now is a new explanation, where new is very much in quotes here, because it's actually an explanation that is uh, at least 100 years old, as we'll show. But it's been getting new attention um, as there's been recent focus on income inequality, and also as these other explanations have proven to not hold a lot of water in terms of uh, capturing declining marriage rates. Right, and so that is something that we heard a lot about yesterday and already today. The idea that there are low economic opportunities, particularly for men at the bottom of the income distribution, um, and there's rising economic inequality, and this is contributing to a decline in marriage. Um, so if I return to some of the economic motivations for marriage that Claudia started off with, we can think about what, this, uh, what these reduced opportunities or rising inequality might do to some of those motivations. Right, so for example, the public goods model or the shared consumption model. Um, if I marry somebody because, you know, if now we have a TV and uh, only, you know, two people can watch one TV or two people can watch one child, <laughs> I don't know which is more entertaining. Um, or, you know, we like to take vacations together. Where there are fewer resources to spend on those consumption items, the value of that um, might become lower. And moreover, if I'm, thinking, if I'm a woman thinking of marrying uh, a man who has very limited economic opportunities and in fact might uh, not be participating in the labor force, then you know, I have to think about everything that I bring home in my job being split. So I'm actually going to reduce um, my consumption by getting married. Right? The social capital, we saw in the last session that there's a decline in the level of social capital that people have at the bottom of the income distribution. So that means that the incentive to marry to have access to the social capital uh, has decreased. Um, and we can talk about specialization here. You know, uh, Claudia was talking about the move to a modern marriage where um, you no longer have a breadwinning male and a woman who stays at home. That um, move away from the specialization model of marriage has been much slower in low education households. So if you ask uh, in survey data, should the man be the breadwinner, that idea still has a lot more weight um, in low education households. So if that is what your model of marriage is, and men are not um, being very successful in their breadwinning efforts, then that might make you less likely to get married. And then something that Joe mentioned, I was uh, Joe Hotz, I was going to refer to his research um, with, that he referred to in the last session. Um, so there's this idea that unwed childbearing is becoming less costly. So you know when we tell uh, 
young women and young men about the dangers of having a child early and out of wedlock, it's often that you'll reduce your opportunities, you know, you won't be able to go to college, you won't be able to have a successful career. For many of these women, college and a successful career were never on the table, and possibly for, uh, and for the, the men that they might marry, right? So if you're in a low opportunity situation, um, then it may not matter so much whether you have a kid or not, um, and the short-term benefits of having a kid um, might become much more attractive. Um, so this is an idea uh, that's recently been advanced by Melissa Carney and Phil Levine that I'll talk about here in a second. I put some media quotes on this one uh, here as well, just because when I started out preparing for this talk, I was looking for things that showed how marriage uh, changes were leading to income inequality, but that simple Google search turned up just as many articles that were showing that income inequality led to the decline of marriage. So here are a couple of those um, examples. And again, Pope Francis uh, really helped us out a lot by uh, talking about this on Wednesday. So one thing that he said in that speech, perhaps there is a fear of failure which prevents men and women from trusting in Christ's promise of grace in marriage and in the family. So in my reading of the, uh, the, um, the address, it's not completely clear what he means by the fear of failure. In some sense, it could be the fear of failing within the marriage, that the marriage itself won't work. But if you, you could also imagine that a fear of economic failure um, would lead people to um, have a fear of being married. Okay, so as I said, this is an idea that has been around for um, many decades. Um, this relationship between fluctuations in economic well-being and fluctuations in marriage rates. Um, so Bill yesterday in the panel, again Bill Evans, was um, showing some time series data and was uh, making the case compellingly that that's not exactly the best way to try to look at whether what's going on with male economic opportunities are leading to um, changes in marriage. Uh, I'm going to push back against that uh, a little bit, which is easier to do since Bill's not here. Um, <laughs> but we can actually learn a little more from the time series data than he was maybe giving uh, credit for in that uh, brief presentation. Right? So it's true that you know, when we see two things moving up or down over time, uh, we don't want to take too much from it. But when we see things fluctuating over time and then they fluctuate together, that's a little bit stronger evidence that they actually are related. Okay? Now, this picture isn't nearly as pretty as the one that he showed. Um, so, you know, you can't see, it, it's not incredibly obvious, but you can kind of tell that when the unemployment rate here, which is the red line, is up since the 1980s, the uh, dotted blue line, which is the marriage rate, tends to be down and vice versa. Right? And so when you do this in a regression framework, um, you, know, you can put in some kind of controls um, for things that are going on, and it's a pretty strong relationship. And episodically, this is true as well. So marriage rates have been uh, decreased during both the Great Depression and the Great Recession, and then that big baby boom uh, and marriage boom that Claudia referenced was in a very uh, a strong period of economic growth post-World War II. Um, okay, so I'll skip this last one here. So I mentioned this Carney and Levine idea. So they're really interested in unwed childbearing, but I think that's, um, that's obviously related to the idea of marriage. Um, and so a couple of things, their argument from that paper, income inequality is associated with a lack of opportunity and social mar marginalization for those at the bottom. The combination of being poor and living in an unequal location leads women to choose early non-marital childbearing at elevated rates because of the low expectations of success. So, you know, Bill also had some of the international evidence in there. And while it's true that um, unwed childbearing uh, and uh, marriage decline has happened across industrialized countries, uh, the trends have been similar, but the levels are actually quite different. So if you look at unwed childbearing, you know, in the United States here with 38 uh, births per 1,000 women age 15 to 19, our teenage childbearing rate is double that of almost every other developed country except uh, Russia and the United Kingdom, right? If you look at um, rates of non-marriage, the U.S. is more in the middle of the distribution, but there's still huge uh, variation across developed countries um, in these patterns. So what Carney and Levine do here to provide some supportive evidence that economic opportunities matter, in this picture they're showing um, the rate of non-marital childbearing for teenagers by mother's level of education, and they break it out by a U.S. state's level of income inequality. Okay, so the dark bars are um, states where there is a little income inequality or less income inequality, and the light bars we have more income inequality. 
right? So what we see for women who have any college education, there's really no relationship between their likelihood of being a teen parent and um, the level of income inequality in their state. But for the high school dropouts, they're more likely to be teenage uh, mothers in states that have the most income inequality. Right, so this is some suggestive evidence. They do, again, some regression analysis to try to uh, do this more precisely. You know, this is not driven by the fact that the South has high income inequality and um, differences in religiosity or political preferences, for example. And they also put in things that are other measures that you would expect to be correlated with income inequality, like the absolute level of poverty or the incarceration rates. Those things actually do not predict um, the teen childbearing once you control for the inequality. So Bill, it showed us the picture, which I found very compelling, about how it doesn't seem to be related to, um, uh, so rates of unwed childbearing in black communities is not related to incarceration. Um, that's actually what Carney and Levine find as well. So incarceration may not be the best measure here um, to test this idea. So in the end here, we want to leave off with some items for discussion perhaps, but we want to think about what to do. So I think uh, both our talk and then the others throughout the day have been really uh, making this point that we want to recognize it's happening disproportionately to different groups within the United States. Um, look beyond some standard explanations, so we ruled out a couple there. Um, and then to continue to consider the role of economic conditions. Now I see this as kind of a good news, bad news prospect here. Um, so, you know, it's bad news in the sense that it's harder to change economic opportunities than it might be to do things like change uh, the tax code to make it so that there's less of a penalty for people to be married. Um, with teenage childbearing specifically, people have tried to use uh, unwed childbearing among teenagers, contraception, abstinence education. Those things have not proven to be successful. If you think it's economic opportunities, that's much harder to change. Where I see this as some good news, though, is that there have been a lot of policies um, at the you know, federal and state level, but I also want to really reference the work of Catholic charities um, and the Catholic Church generally to try to address uh, the issue of poverty. And I know that Catholic charities in recent years has really tried to shift their focus from treating the symptoms of poverty to try to look at the root causes. And that's part of what's driving their collaboration with the Lab for Economic Opportunities at Notre Dame. Um, and so if, you, if those policies have been designed just to try to um, make people's lives better, well, not just, but to, you know, to try to make people's lives better, improve their opportunities, a very important additional benefit to those policies could be uh, to try to also strengthen families. Right? So in, to some sense, some of the things that people are already doing may help us uh, in this regard. And then lastly, you know, why it's important. We've heard a lot about the first two. So this is something on which economists uh, and Catholic social teaching very much agree, that there are a lot of spillover benefits to uh, healthy marriages in a society. So I've chosen you know, one quote here out of many I could have chosen. Um, in the last session, we saw some really uh, good evidence on the intergenerational effects uh, of marriages. But I'll point out one that you know, I think has been floating around here, but I haven't, hasn't actually been formalized. We've seen arguments both for an effect of inequality on marriage decline and for an effect of marriage decline on inequality. Well, if it goes both ways, then this is a, a cycle, a spiral, if you will, um, toward ever-growing inequality and worse, uh, worse marriage prospects. Right? So anything that we can do to try to uh, throw a cog uh, in that um, spiral would, uh, would be a good idea. And I'll leave it at that.